chapters one and two of the barnabys in america this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by celine major the barnabys in america the final sequel to the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope chapter one introductory the affections of the human heart are various all equally genuine when nature is untampered with but infinitely modified as to their intensity the love of a parent for its offspring has been acknowledged on all hands to be one of the strongest and least uncertain of these affections partaking so largely of instinct as fairly to class it among the immutable laws of nature and though certainly shared by the beasts which perish yet felt to be venerable from the divinity of the origin whence the common well-spring rises there is a modification however of this parental love which is wholly free from and undegraded by any community either with the beasts of the field the fishes of the sea the reptiles which crawl upon the earth or the birds which fly towards the heavens there is a parental love so purely spiritual so wholly intellectual as to place it in sublimity far above any other affection of the human heart what may this be demand the uninitiated unhappy ones like a childless wife and a husband without an heir ye are unconscious of the fondest yearning that ever swelled a human breast but is there an author who does not at once secretly acknowledge his sympathy in the feeling thus described oh no not one yet elevated as is the nature of this intellectual love there may be many who are shy to confess it many strange to say who affect a total indifference nay almost oblivion concerning those offsprings of the brain for whom by every law human and divine they ought to feel the tenderest partiality let no such men be trusted it is doing them an injustice to believe that they can be sincere far otherwise is it with the progenitor of the widow barnaby i scruple not to confess that with all her faults and she has some i love her dearly i owe her many mirthful moments and the deeper pleasure still of believing that she has brought mirthful moments to others also honestly avowing this to be the case can any one wonder can any one blame me for feeling an affectionate longing at my heart to follow her upon the expedition upon which i sent her when we last parted an expedition too that was to lead her to a land which all the world knows i cherish in my memory with peculiar delight i will not believe it but trusting to the long-established and good-humoured toleration of those who descend to listen to my gossipings i will forthwith proceed to tell them all that has happened to this dear excellent lady since general hubert and mr stephenson left her in her grand drawing-room in curzon street surrounded by her family and friends chapter two domestic conversation public announcement of a private marriage indignation of the bride at a misnomer scenes in the seclusion of mr o'donagough's library parental thoughts on marriage i have enjoyed that patty and i won't deny it cried the ci-devant widow barnaby as the above-named gentleman quitted her drawing-room heaven knows i am not a spiteful person and i can forgive and forget as soon as anybody but it was absolutely beyond nature not to enjoy letting those two puffed-up top-sawyer fellows see that you had contrived to get married my dear while the way-faced miss elizabeth was still a poor pale thin ghost of a spinster as i may say for so she is dearest compared to you oh lord don't talk of her mamma the very thought of her makes me sick if it don't i'll be hanged replied madame espartero cristinino tornorino giving a little shudder and creeping still closer to her loving husband till her handsome face was half hid in his bosom oh my goodness for how much i wonder would i change places with her not for a trifle i have a notion my dear said her mother laughing heartily but i'd give just sixpence to see how my conceited niece agnes looks when she hears you are married i'd make an even bet that she won't believe it but will you lay me that she does not take it for a joke of that gay chap frederick stephenson no no she would if she could i don't doubt that mamma in the least replied the bride but it is not so easy to do as to wish i suppose she will have some wedding cake sent her won't she i'll take care of that my dear said miss louisa perkins nodding her head with a look of great intelligence your dear mamma has given me a little hint about that business already and of course your own noble relations will come first oh yes my darling creature exclaimed miss matilda with a stifled sigh we will all take care of that depend upon it 
and do oh do my dearest dearest patty let me have the tying up your name cards together it will be such a delight if dear mrs o'donagough will just give me a shilling or two for it i'll go out and buy the silver twist for them this very moment oh with another sigh it will be such a sweet office by the by that is well thought of matilda observed the fond and provident mother mercy on me patty now one comes to think of it what a whirl you have put us all in with this frolic of yours silver twist is the least of it matilda there must be favours just as if we had been all regularly at church together you know i am not going to let the wedding of my only daughter with a first-rate spanish nobleman pass over as if we were just common ordinary people who had never been to court or distinguished in any way of course you won't exclaimed both the miss perkinses in a breath and miss matilda confident in intimacy added i am sure you would be a fool if you did and then there is the sending it to the papers you know mamma said madame e c tornorino with energy i do beg that may not be forgotten mercy on me cried her mother to think that i should keep sitting here with such an awful deal of business to do it is all very natural that you two should like to keep together there billing and cooing like a pair of wood pigeons but it will never do for us my dear don tornorino will you just step down into your father-in-law's library and look for a pen and ink and a sheet of paper and then i will give you leave to whisper to patty till dinner-time if you like it the tall bridegroom rose from his place to obey her and using a little gentle violence to disengage his coat-collar from the fond grasp of his affectionate bride very respectfully pronounced the words yes ma'am and left the room isn't he beautiful mamma demanded the young wife as soon as he had disappeared he is ten thousand million times handsomer than jack ever was or ever will be isn't he he is a very fine man patty there is no doubt of it replied mrs o'donagough i always admired that style of man the whiskers and hair and all that you know i have always thought that it gave particularly the air of a gentleman i might indeed say of a nobleman exactly that cried miss matilda perkins mrs o'donagough always expresses herself so happily he is a fine man a stylish man patty that is exactly what he is and many and many's the girl that will look upon you with envy my dear take my word for that well i can't help it if they do matilda replied the well-pleased madame tornorino but i wish you would not send him away mamma why could not matilda or your own particular friend louisa have gone for the pen and ink i do think it is very hard to send one's husband away the very first day after one is married to him but who could guess patty that he would be staying so unaccountably long returned her mother lor bless my soul i could have made the paper by this time and i shall have altogether forgot what came into my head about what was to be sent to the newspaper haven't you got a scrap of paper either of you and a pencil the ready hand of the faithful louisa was in her pocket in an instant and from its varied stores she drew forth the lady's polite remembrancer for the year which contained a little pencil very neatly cut for writing will this do dear mrs o'donagough said she presenting it do lor no i shall break it in half a minute but however that don't much signify i must just write down a word or two to keep what i was thinking of in my head it was so exactly the right sort of thing give me some paper louisa paper oh dear me where can i find any i wonder do my dear darling miss patty tell me where i can find a bit of paper for good mamma on being thus addressed the newly married lady suddenly sprung from the sofa on which she had been seated and rushing across the room with a movement more resembling the spring of a powerful young panther than anything else seized the gentle louisa by the shoulders and shook her heartily i'll teach you to call me miss patty you nasty old maid you how dare you do any such thing don't you know that if i am miss patty still i am just no better than i ought to be and a pretty thing that is for you to say of your own best friend's only daughter aren't you ashamed of yourself aren't you then i am indeed my dearest mrs tourney oh dear me how shall i speak what i don't no more understand than if it was just so much greek you must please indeed you must just to write down for me your name exactly as you wish to have it spoken and you shall see that i will never do the same thing again no never as long as i live well then don't bother any more about it now but just get mamma some paper by dint of hunting in various drawers a sheet of paper was at length found upon which mrs o'donagough notwithstanding the fragility of her pencil contrived to scrawl the following paragraph by special license 
martha the only daughter and sole heiress of john william o'donagough esq to don espartero cristinino tornorino we are happy to learn from the most unquestionable authority that though a foreigner this distinguished nobleman is in every respect worthy of the enviable preference which has been given him by the most admired beauty of the present season the sensation produced by the appearance of this young lady at the last drawing-room will probably cause her immediate marriage to be a source of disappointment to many having after a good many revisals completed her composition mrs o'donagough read it aloud with all the dignity it deserved and then said what do you think of that ladies why it is first-rate beautiful mamma replied patty rubbing her hands only you know it is a downright lie as ever was told for me and my darling were married by bands we took care about that as to all the rest it is true enough for all i know to the contrary well dear and what does that little scratch of the pen signify whether it's true or not demanded her mother nobody will know anything about it and it sounds better doesn't it well there let it stand mamma it is not worth disputing about certainly married is married all the world over and what you say about him is all right and correct but where is he darling beauty i tell you what mrs o'donagough it won't do for you to be sending my husband about right and left mind that if you please and now you see papa's keeping him whether he will or no i won't bear it any longer that's what i won't so good-bye to you all and so saying madame tornorino darted out of the room oh heavens how that charming creature's affection touches me exclaimed miss matilda perkins how animated how beautiful is her conjugal tenderness ah who can witness it and not look with envy upon happiness so pure and so exalted she added almost inaudibly patty meanwhile made her way rapidly by a sort of sliding movement of her hand down the banisters rather than by the use of her feet a mode of descending the stairs to which she was greatly addicted when in good spirits to the door of the room dignified by the appellation of the library and throwing it open without ceremony found herself considerably to her surprise in the presence of two persons who were beyond all questions wrangling violently and unhappily for her new-born felicity poor little lady these persons were her father and her husband how dare you look so savagely cross at my darling tornorino papa she exclaimed with great indignation and at the same time throwing her arms round her husband who as well as her father was standing how dare you i say don't knit your brows at me papa for you know as well as i do that i don't care the hundredth part of a farthing for your frowns and that i didn't either before i was a married woman so i leave you to guess how much i care for them now but i won't have my dear darling plagued that i won't so mind what you are about old gentleman this is no time for playing the fool patty replied her father in a voice which despite all the courage of her native spirit strengthened as it now was by her matronly position made her quail did i serve you right hussy i should push you out of doors this instant with the beggarly fellow you have thought proper to choose for a husband why do you let him talk so don tornorino exclaimed poor patty bursting into tears you know it's all lies why do you let him go on so hold your tongue girl and hear me resumed her father in a tone that neither the bride nor bridegroom could listen to unmoved i have been asking this fine whiskered hero of yours a few questions and from his agreeable answers it appears perfectly evident that the coat upon his back constitutes by far the most valuable part of his possessions this being the case my young madam i will beg you to inform me how and where you intend to live i don't believe a word of it i don't sobbed patty trembling both with rage and fear he is a don he told me so himself i know he is a don aren't you a don my dear aren't you never mind you no talk miss patty say anything a propos de moi listen dutiful of votre bon papa replied her husband disengaging himself from her arms and placing himself behind a chair in order as it should seem to keep out of her way do you call me miss patty you traitor of a man screamed the unfortunate wife if my papa is the dear good papa he used to be he'll teach you to call your own lawful wife by such a name as that won't you dear pa won't you make him treat me like a married woman if the high-minded mr o'donagough did love anything in the world besides himself it certainly was his daughter 
and even at the present moment though harassed by a pretty considerable variety of disagreeable thoughts he could not see the showers of tears which fell from her bright eyes without enough of pity and tenderness to moderate the angry feelings with which he had just addressed her and to produce a tone of much greater gentleness as he said i am sorry for you my poor patty with all my heart and soul but it will do no good to mince the matter you have married yourself to a fellow without a sixpence and there are some fathers who would make little difficulty of easing themselves at once of all trouble concerning you by turning you both into the street together but i have not the heart to do it patty though god knows at this time the fewer burdens i have the better however your mother's income is settled upon her and in case of the worst may be worth keeping and so all things considered i am determined to treat you better than you deserve and take you along with me i have explained myself pretty fully to your husband and he has wit enough whatever other qualities he may want to understand how i shall expect he will behave himself so no more sobbing and crying patty we must one and all make the best of a very bad matter things might be worse i don't mean as to your marriage for i don't see exactly how that could be but i might have been found considerably worse prepared for the accident that has happened to me what do you mean papa demanded the astonished patty her eyes opened greatly beyond their usual ample dimensions her curls hastily pushed back and her head extended forwards to the utmost extent of her handsome throat what in heaven's name are you talking about if my tornorino is not really a don he is a monstrous liar and that he knows as well as i but i am ready to forget and forgive because he is such a darling and because it is as clear as light that he only said it for the sake of being the more sure of getting me and if you'll forgive and forget it too papa it will be very good-natured of you but what in the world has that to do with my going along with you going along where i should like to know i don't mean to go along anywhere and that's flat i mean to stay here and show off my wedding-ring and my wedding-clothes and my handsome husband to my aunt hubert and my cousins and that nasty brute of a beast jack that was and everybody else that i ever saw or knew in all my life before so please not to say anything more about going along for all the along i shall be going will just be driving along the streets in mamma's beautiful carriage to buy wedding-clothes the spirit of mr john william patrick allen o'donagough seldom failed him and to do him justice it must be avowed that he rarely permitted any emotion to be visible on his countenance which it was his wish to hide but as he listened to this speech from the animated patty he looked a less great a less philosophical man than usual for a moment he turned away his head to avoid her gaze and his complexion varied but this lasted not long a very short interval sufficed to restore him to his wonted happy hardihood and then he composedly turned to his son-in-law saying with very perfect self-possession get upstairs tornorino i want to speak to my daughter alone the don who did not appear to show in any large degree the firmness of nerve possessed by his distinguished father-in-law delayed not for the hundredth part of a second to obey him but instantly slipped out of the room despite the extended hand of his wife which seemed stretched out as if to clutch him and impede his departure sit down patty said mr o'donagough the puzzled patty obeyed her eyes still steadily fixed upon her mysterious parent i am sorry to tell you patty that your silly marriage is not the only nor perhaps the worst misfortune that has fallen upon us within the last twenty-four hours said he i wish you would not go on talking of my marriage in that way papa said the bride recovering her courage as her father's manner towards her softened i am the best judge i suppose whether my husband is the man i love and i tell you once for all that he is and if it turns out that he is not particularly rich because of his leaving most of his money behind in his own country what can that signify i should like to know when as mamma says i am your only sole heiress and you as rich as you are with your fine house and carriage and going to court and the lord knows what besides mr o'donagough knit his brows but presently relaxed the frown and sighed deeply that is just the point my poor dear child upon which i want to speak to you i have a very singular history to disclose patty which will explain only too well all that now appears mysterious to you said he having thus spoken he paused for a moment and fixed his eyes full upon her face with great solemnity but just as he seemed about to resume his discourse patty stopped him by saying pray papa will everybody go on calling me patty as you do i can't say i like it at all it's a monstrous disappointment to me why shouldn't i be called by my husband's name with mrs before it like other married women 
i do think it is very hard i will call you mrs tornorino my dear if you wish it replied her father with a smile which certainly notwithstanding his constitutional strength of mind gave him a good deal the air of a very foolish fond old man but you know darling that when parents have got a beautiful young married daughter like you they always continue to call them by their christian name that is as long as they continue young and beautiful do they oh i did not know that well then papa you may go on so if you please but i hope nobody else will for tornorino is certainly the very prettiest name i ever heard in my life don't you think it is papa my dear dear patty i dare say i shall think any name that belongs to you pretty but i have a great deal of business patty that must be done directly and i do beg you will listen to what i am going to say do now there's a good girl now i am sure you say that only to torment me papa and for no other reason in the whole world exclaimed patty with great vehemence you will never make me believe that let a married woman be as young as she will she ought to be called girl it is a downright insult and if tornorino has as much spirit as a rat he won't bear it that he won't mr o'donagough's fondness began to give way to anger and it was decidedly more a ban than a blessing which burst from his lips as he started out of his chair and striding towards his daughter placed his hands upon her shoulder shaking her with more energy than gentleness by the heaven above us patty i'm afraid you are a greater fool than i took you for if you were six instead of sixteen you might listen to me when i tell you that i want to speak on matters of the greatest possible importance but if you really are too silly to care for anything but your own nonsense i shall leave you to your fate and that may very likely lead to the turning you and your fine moustache into the street before you are many hours older these words were uttered with very considerable vehemence and before patty could sufficiently recover her wits to answer them her angry father had passed through the door and banged it together after him end of chapters one and two chapters three and four of the barnabys in america by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three a narrative full of mystery and interest recorded by a father to his child natural emotions of the youthful mind prudent resolves notwithstanding the dauntless style in which the spirited young bride had received her father's rebuke upon the penniless nature of the connection she had formed she was not altogether unconscious that it was deserved or indifferent to the dangers which might arise to herself and her darling were pa to get downright cross with her it was therefore with no lingering movement that she scrambled across the room after him threw open the door again and sprung upon the back of his neck just as his foot reached the first stair much after the fashion of a favourite young newfoundland dog who has attained his full size but not his full gravity and discretion most assuredly mr o'donagough was in no playful mood and perhaps his very first impulse upon receiving this powerful caress was to have rejected it with equal vigour by a backward movement of the leg just raised in act to mount but he felt that it was the hand of patty that was at his throat and his one virtue mastering him he turned round with something between a smile and a frown saying don't be a fool patty what do you want want my own dear pop want you to be sure how could you run away from your own poor dear patty so and she just married too and all for nothing in the world but because she wanted to have a bit of fun with you come along back with me pa and see if i don't listen to all you have got to say as grave as a judge you see if i don't o'donagough wholly overcome by this pretty naivete very lovingly threw his arm around her waist and returned into the room they had left but still his step and manner were so very solemn that madame tornorino began to be frightened outright and when he had placed her in one chair and himself in another exactly opposite to her she looked as sober and sedate as he could possibly have desired it will be necessary my dear child he began in order to make you fully understand my present very embarrassing situation that i should relate to you some circumstances of my early life with which you are and indeed your excellent mother also as yet unacquainted while still a very young man my dear patty and to speak with the degree of frankness necessary to the full comprehension of my singular history by no means ill-looking in fact i was exceedingly like yourself patty at this period my dear i unfortunately happened to be quartered with my regiment at windsor the regent subsequently our beloved monarch george the fourth was holding his splendid court there the precise time of which i speak need not be mentioned 
indeed for many painfully important reasons it will be greatly best that i should avoid doing so and i will therefore beg of you my dear to ask me no questions all that is essential you should know i will freely communicate to you and for the rest here mr o'donagough paused for a moment and rested his forehead upon his extended hand as if wishing to conceal some too powerful emotion with which his soul was struggling but after one deep-drawn sigh he proceeded amidst the brightest ornaments of that splendid court my dear child was a young lady possessed of a degree of beauty which even at this distance of time i cannot recall without a violence of emotion that shakes every nerve and teaches me that there are feelings that neither time nor circumstance can obliterate but alas my patty the dignity of her birth and station equalled the beauty of her person the proudest nobles of the land vied with each other for her favour all the world loved her but she alas alas loved me alone this too lovely this too beloved lady was in the habit of walking frequently upon the terrace of the castle her high rank ensured her admittance at all times and i from my military command found it only too easy to invent ostensible reasons for being there also that terrace that noble windsor terrace patty is known to billions and remembered fondly by all who have seen it as one of the most enchanting spots on earth but alas where is the aching throbbing palpitating memory which recollects like mine where is there another heart which bounds yet sinks which trembles yet exults at the mere sound of its name as mine does my child it was upon that terrace that the mutual love of that noble lady and your too happy yet too wretched father was mutually confessed and mutually returned she loved me patty loved me did i say she worshipped she adored me and i can you blame me my dear child if here mr o'donagough was very strongly agitated notwithstanding his evident struggles to master his feelings he found himself obliged to draw forth his pocket-handkerchief and apply it to his eyes can you i say blame me patty if i loved too good gracious no papa not the least bit in the world replied his daughter i am sure you would have been a most horrid monster of a man if you had not but do go on pa and tell me what happened next did you run away with her as my don did with me patty i dare not tell you more of this eventful history well i never exclaimed patty looking exceedingly disappointed no never in all my life heard anything like that just as if telling could signify now when it must have been such ages and ages ago don't be foolish papa there's a dear good man but go on and for goodness sake tell me all that happened between you and this grand lady well to be sure it's no great wonder that you hold your head so high as you do sometimes i must say that for you pap but pray does mamma know all about it whether she does or not however don't signify a straw for i am positively dying to hear the rest and hear it i must so go on papa when i bid you for the rest my dear there is but little more that can or ought to be said replied mr o'donagough with an air of discretion befitting the circumstances all that i can further relate concerns myself only the vigilant eyes of those who surrounded the noble lady who by the way it is necessary i should tell you was a countess in her own right were not slow in discovering how matters stood and the consequence to me may be easily guessed though well born and highly educated and with a military reputation for why should i deny it patty of the very highest class i was still considered as immeasurably below the noble object of my love her proud and cruel friends would not for an instant endure the idea of a marriage between us which would make her title descend to my offspring i was ordered to go abroad immediately and a multitude of injurious reports were industriously attached to my name in the hope of estranging the heart of my beloved countess i went patty a broken-hearted wanderer i quitted my native shores and looked my last upon my noble love but guess my agonies when i tell you that almost the first news i received from england brought me the account of her marriage with a nobleman of rank equal to her own it is torture to remember it but no more of this patty i must not i dare not dwell on all i have suffered years rolled on and brought with them the healing balm that ever rests upon their wings i saw your excellent mother i saw admired wooed and won her patty and oh for her sake as well as for other most important reasons i would not wish this history to be greatly talked of that you should converse respecting it with your mother is of course perfectly natural 
but do not dwell upon the passion i have described to you it may pain her by your own feelings for don tornorino my dear love you may guess what hers are for me the high nobility of my first passion will not suffice to heal the mortification arising from knowing that she never could have been more than second in my heart you will now in your present situation easily understand all this and will have too much tenderness for her i am sure to wound her feelings unnecessarily you understand me yes i suppose i understand you papa replied patty but i can't help thinking that what you say is very nonsensical because it is downright humbug and nothing else to talk of you and mamma being like tornorino and me however i'll do just whatever you like about it and though you are so old now it is a beautiful love story as ever was wrote in a book and i must and will tell my don of it you won't mind that i suppose no my dear patty not at all replied her father affectionately on the contrary my love i wish him to be acquainted with all the peculiarities of my situation they are very peculiar and now i must proceed to explain you why it is that now for the first time i consider it proper to open my heart to you on this painful subject it is believe me a theme inexpressibly distressing to me particularly at this moment when i would willingly have devoted myself to making the early days of your married life my poor child pass gaily and joyously but unhappily i am compelled to announce to you the very disagreeable fact that unless your husband has a home of his own to take you to your honeymoon my pretty patty must be passed on board ship good gracious why i shan't like that at all i promise you i mean that mamma shall go out with me directly to buy some wedding clothes and there will be no fun in being fine unless there is somebody to admire me i do beg papa that wherever you are going you won't set off till i have received all my visits and returned them too i am dying for my cousin elizabeth to see my wedding ring and hear me call my tall grand-looking husband tornorino i am certain as that i am here that she will be just ready to die with envy nothing can be more natural than your feelings my dear patty and it grieves me to the heart that i cannot indulge you in them but you have not heard my sad story yet my dear the persecution i have undergone has been terrible beyond belief as long as the sweet angel lived i was obliged either to remain out of the country or else return under a feigned name and live in the most complete retirement to avoid the possibility of her knowing that i was near her alas patty a jealous husband is the most terrible of tyrants god grant that this dreadful fate may never be yours oh there is no danger at all of that papa for i love my handsome husband a great deal too well to let anybody else make love to me that is a great blessing my dear a very great blessing but to return to my sad story one might have hoped patty might one not that when the lovely countess was no more the tyrants might have ceased to persecute the hope of this was i assure you the only thing which enabled me to retain my senses when i lost her but no even in this i have been deceived for a short time indeed after my last return from abroad on which return you and your excellent mother accompanied me i was permitted to breathe the air of my native land unmolested and it was dear to me because it was the air my eleonora had breathed but last night i received the astounding information that your appearance at court where you were recognized as my daughter had given rise to the most injurious suspicions there are persons in certain circles patty who have not scrupled to hint that the excellent woman whom before heaven i declare to be your mother is no more to you than your nurse and that your real mother was no other than the lamented harris i have named to you this as you will immediately perceive throws a doubt upon the succession to her title and estates which if it takes wind may plunge the whole of her noble family into the horrible exposure of a trial and a lawsuit i have accordingly received official hints that unless by at once withdrawing myself i relieve the family from this alarm measures will be immediately resorted to for the purpose of removing me from england for ever i leave you to guess what my feelings were on receiving this intimation why they don't mean to say that i ought to be the countess do they papa demanded patty with considerable vivacity not exactly that my dear no one i believe has hitherto ventured to assert as a fact what under the circumstances it would be so exceedingly difficult to prove nobody as yet has gone that length but be this as it may of the necessity of our immediately leaving england there can be no question were i to delay a week i have little doubt that i should find myself an object of the most tyrannical persecution and that probably for life 
i have therefore no time to lose and i have taken this early opportunity of communicating these facts to you in order that you might make up your mind either to accompany your mother and myself to the united states of america or to go immediately with your husband to such home as he can provide for you how do you decide patty i will tell you in a minute papa if you will only let me ask you one or two questions she replied then make a short work of your questions patty for i have no time to lose said mr o'donagough once again portentously knitting his brows don't look cross papa and i will have done in a minute and please in the first place to tell me whether it is quite sure and certain that i can never be a countess in my own right i am sorry to say my dear that there is not the slightest chance of it gravely replied mr o'donagough that's no go then responded patty with a slight sigh now then she resumed my next question is whether being so fond of me as you are and i your only child whether i say you could not give me before you go fortune enough for me and don tornorino to live on here a little in good flashing style just to plague the huberts and that nasty beast jack before we go out after you and mamma to america here again my dear child said mr o'donagough with a truly paternal smile i recognize the most natural feelings and believe me i fully sympathize in them but i lament to say that what you ask is altogether impossible for the tyrants who pursue me with their jealous vengeance do you mean the lady's husband papa cried patty with a sudden burst of irrepressible curiosity pardon me my dear i cannot answer replied her father with solemnity nor is it in any way necessary that i should in order to make you fully comprehend my position whoever they be who pursue me their power over me is such that i cannot without the most imminent risk to my liberty and even to my life attempt to realize any part of my property indeed i have but too much reason to fear that by far the greater portion of the funds upon which i reckoned as the source from which your fortune should be drawn and our own handsome manner of living supplied will be rendered entirely unavailable by this last stroke of barbarous jealousy all that can be done for our future comfort depend upon it my dear patty i will do but if you and your husband after properly taking into consideration the fact of my almost ruined fortunes shall still decide upon accompanying us into exile it must be with the understanding that you are uniting your fortunes to those of a poor man compared to what i believed myself to be a very poor man and must conduct yourselves accordingly patty looked exceedingly grave and remained silent considerably longer than was her wont on any occasion but her father wished to hear what she had got to say in reply to his communication and waited patiently till she spake at length after heaving rather a deep sigh she said with an expression somewhat indicative of alarm upon her countenance i don't know what my don will say to it papa because i always told him that you was so monstrous rich good gracious what shall i do if he should grow cross about it and leave off loving me i do think upon my honour that it would drive me mad in that case my dear love replied her father composedly i should of course turn him out of doors immediately what my own dear darling husband and i left by myself without any husband at all no no mr pap you'll do no such thing as that i promise you what you must do is this dear papa you must squeeze out every penny you can save from every other earthly thing and give it all to my dear don and that you know will keep him in good humour even if you don't happen to live out in america in such a grand house as this that is what you really will do my own dear darling pap isn't it and patty sprung across the space which divided them threw her arms round his neck and began kissing him with more vehemence than she had ever done before save once when she had conceived an ardent affection for a pink satin dress which his fiat alone could enable her to obtain upon that occasion she had succeeded the pink satin dress had been the reward of her kisses and it was perhaps the remembrance of this fact which made her now shower them so liberally but her father seemed not in the kissing vein for he disengaged himself though gently from her clinging embraces and quietly replied the best thing you can do patty is to tell your husband the whole of the melancholy story which i have just told you he will then understand how things are and if as i suspect his own circumstances are such as still to make his sticking close to us the best thing he can do i dare say he will have common sense enough to keep his ground without being very troublesome it is indeed not impossible that i may find him useful and in that case i have no doubt but we shall go on very comfortably patty pretty well knew when there was anything to be gained from pa and when there was not the present use of which experience was to make her quietly walk off saying that she would soon make her dear don understand all about it 
chapter four philosophical thoughts brief review of the financial affairs of mr o'donagough conjugal harmony and unity of purpose pleasant jestings mixed with serious thoughts to prepare his beautiful patty for the change she was about to undergo was perhaps not the least disagreeable of the various operations which mr john william patrick allen o'donagough knew that he had to perform before he set out upon the expedition which as doubtless all the world will remember general hubert had so strenuously recommended it had taken the affectionate father some fifteen or twenty minutes to decide in what manner the news could be conveyed to the happy bride his daughter with the least annoyance to her sensitive feelings but from the moment the matter presented itself to his imagination in the shape which had been shown forth in the last chapter every unpleasant sensation vanished nay the interview which he had previously dreaded became in a considerable degree agreeable to him it is i believe a notorious fact in natural history that whatever instinct or faculty nature has bestowed upon an animal with predominating strength causes in its exercise the most decided gratification and it would be difficult to bring in evidence a stronger confirmation of this interesting phenomenon than the state of feeling produced on the mind of mr o'donagough by the act of lying his spirits seemed to rise his faculties to expand themselves his features assumed a look of animation and intelligence inconceivably beyond what they ever manifested at any other time and if the observer's eye could have gone deeper and penetrated to his heart it would have been found gaily bounding in his bosom in a sort of triumphant jubilee at the bold feats of his undaunted tongue on the whole therefore the half-hour he had bestowed upon patty had done him good and it was with no faltering voice that he called to her as she quitted the room bidding her to send her mother to him mr o'donagough was as we have said a man of very considerable firmness of nerve and had never at any period of his life been found infirm of purpose within half an hour of leaving his third drawing-room on the preceding night in the manner described in a former series of the records of this interesting family he had pretty fully made up his mind as to what he should do with himself and his belongings though he felt that the earth was not wholly before him where to choose he was aware that quite a sufficient quantity remained open for him to prevent any embarrassment on the score of elbow-room nor had he that very dispiriting misfortune to contend with which arises from the want of those sinews so well known to be necessary in every operation which man carries on either with or against man his lady's provident wisdom had taken care at the time of their marriage that all that was hers should remain her own and her little income was therefore as long as they remained together a sort of pialet fund which would always prevent their being in actual want this was well snug comfortable and soothing but this was by no means the most agreeable financial feature in his case from the time that to use his own phrase he had sown those wild oats which had in some way or other occasioned his last excursion across the ocean to the present period when it was likely that a second voyage would be the best remedy for the little contretemps which had occurred in his third drawing-room he had never ceased adding to that small stock of private pocket-money which he had begun to collect at his sociable whist parties at sydney it is hardly fair perhaps to lift the veil of reserve by which he had ever kept the amount of this concealed even from the wife of his bosom but as accident has made me acquainted with the amount thus collected i am tempted to name it as a proof useful may it be to the unthrifty of what may be done by steady and persevering labour mr o'donagough then at this time stood possessed of a sum amounting to twelve thousand eight hundred ninety nine pounds of which his wife had no more knowledge than the man in the moon and this be it observed was safely stowed and funded in the english stocks so that it was exclusive of the contents of poor mr ronaldson's purse and pocket-book which however amounted to very nearly a thousand more and which now made the pleasant feeling lining of his own coat-pocket assuredly if ever man deserved the honourable title of a chevalier d'industrie it was mr john william patrick allen o'donagough for never did he lose an opportunity of putting his time to profit let it occur at what period of twenty-four hours it might it may be thought perhaps that in this statement of mr o'donagough's possessions i have carelessly overlooked the very showy furniture of his handsome house in curzon street but in point of fact i have been strictly accurate inasmuch as no single article of that furniture had been paid for and consequently in a statement so precise as the present it could not properly have been brought to account mr o'donagough was in the act of mentally running over precisely the same figures as i have been now laying before the reader when the door of his library opened and his wife appeared 
the interview which was about to take place would have been considerably more agreeable to the gentleman's feelings had he deemed it advisable in stating to his lady the sudden necessity for breaking up his london establishment to have indulged in the same imaginative species of narrative as that in which he had conveyed the same information to his daughter but after a moment's consideration his admirable judgment decided him against attempting anything of the kind for he felt that in the first place it would rob him of the advantage he might hope to obtain from the very acute faculties of his admirable wife and secondly those very acute faculties now fully ripened into strong practical sharpness would be exceedingly likely to detect what was purely inventive and thereby render his explanation of no effect determined therefore to be as candid in his exposition of facts as if he had been stating matters to his own conscience he lost no time in circumlocution shut the door wife he said rather gravely as mrs o'donagough came in and then added rather in a lower key and you may as well bolt it my dear and then we shall not be interrupted dear me mr o'donagough how very foolish this is of you she replied but obeyed his command however before she advanced into the room i know exactly word for word what you are going to say as well as if you had spoken it every syllable already do you my dear said o'donagough i doubt it yes i do you are going to make a preachment as long as my arm about patty's marriage and what good is it when the thing is done and over i know very well that i would rather have had an english lord for her but there's no use fretting about it and i will never forgive you as long as i live if you refuse to give me down a good handsome sum of money out of your last night's winnings to buy the dear creature's wedding clothes a good deal of it i know we may have on credit but not all nor anything like all and if you please i want to set about it immediately i have not the least objection in the world my dear replied mr o'donagough and if you will be kind enough to hear what i was going to say which has nothing whatever to do with patty you shall set out and buy the wedding clothes immediately after if you like it mrs o'donagough was too reasonable a woman to ask for a fairer promise than this and accordingly she placed herself in the chair that her daughter had just before occupied and replied now then donny with the most sweet-tempered smile in the world it is rather an awkward thing my dear that i have got to mention to you and if you were not the devilish clever woman that you are i should never tell you of it at all but if you will set your wit side by side with mine i am not the least bit afraid but we shall get through the business perfectly well and do better for what i know than if it had never happened and what has happened replied his wife in an accent of considerable alarm why first and foremost that hideous old maid elizabeth peters hit off the truth last night as cleverly as if she had been the witch she looks like and obligingly addressed me as major allen before mrs stephenson civilly requesting to tell her why i had changed my name insolent wretch see if i won't be revenged of her impertinence exclaimed the sympathizing wife and what did you say to her my dear why my love i had not time to say much because that very fascinating personage mrs stephenson and this above-mentioned miss elizabeth peters had politely concealed themselves behind the curtains of the recess in order to watch me play piquet with mr ronaldson foxcroft was in the room with us and good-natured fellow as you know he is he gave me half in fun you know of course a hint or two of the cards ronaldson held all which these charming ladies saw and at the very moment when i was in the act of making so good a thing of it as would have made it signify but little whether patty's don were rich or poor they popped out of their hiding-place and told ronaldson not to sign the cheque for that he had been cheated audacious wretches exclaimed mrs o'donagough her expressive countenance beaming with rage oh my dearest donny had i been there they had dared not for their lives have done it in your own house too when they were enjoying the protection of your roof and revelling in the magnificence of your splendid hospitality surely it is unprecedented in the annals of visiting they shall be exposed for it they shall be known for what they are or my name is not o'donagough why donny i shall never again be able to own my connection with them they have disgraced themselves for ever all very true my dear replied her husband composedly but nevertheless ronaldson did not sign the cheque and i shall be obliged to leave the country with as little delay as possible leave the country leave curzon street 
and just when i am going to show off my darling patty everywhere as the youngest and most beautiful married woman in london oh it is impossible you never can be such a brute cried the unhappy mrs o'donagough in the most piercing accents imaginable you do not appear to see this affair with your usual clear-headed good sense my dear replied her husband with exemplary gentleness of voice and manner perhaps you are not aware that if i do not take myself off and that immediately the secretary of state for the home department will have all the trouble upon his own hands but even in that case you perceive your bridal gaieties would be equally defeated for should we go at least i should and under the circumstances i don't think you would find your residence here at all agreeable afterwards what do you mean donny said the vexed lady looking at his placid countenance with considerable indignation what have all the secretaries of state in the world to do with our staying in this beautiful house or leaving it if you are only joking and making fun of me as you do with that fool foxcroft i never will forgive you as long as i live that would be very terrible my dear he mildly replied but fortunately at this moment i run no risk of the kind for i certainly do not consider the matter as partaking of the least degree of the nature of a joke nor do i see anything like fun in being transported for life transported shrieked mrs o'donagough you don't mean it you don't mean to say husband that you have really been such a fool as to do anything to put you in the power of those horrid women you don't mean to tell me that oh donny donny i shall go mad god forbid my dear he replied without varying a muscle of his truly philosophical physiognomy anything of the kind would be exceedingly troublesome just now but really my dear you agitate yourself much more than there is any occasion for and to tell you the truth i thought my barnaby was too much a woman of the world to suffer such an occurrence as this to shake her courage so violently if you will but see the thing in a proper light and give me your assistance in getting everything ready and in giving the whole affair rather the appearance of a party of pleasure than anything else i have no doubt that we shall do extremely well there are many people of very high fashion in the united states particularly at new orleans and in the other slave states and if we contrive to manage our affairs only as well as we have done before my dear you may depend upon it we shall soon find ourselves in the very highest rank of society and perhaps better off than we have ever been in our lives mrs o'donagough was a woman of strong feelings yet nevertheless she was always or almost always amenable to reason and long before her husband had ceased speaking her fine spirit had recovered its tone she felt able and perfectly willing too to take the particular bull which now appeared to face her by the horns and by the noble exercise of the faculties of which she felt proudly conscious to do battle with whatever difficulties might assail her nothing doubting from the hints her judicious husband had thrown out that her reward would now be what it had so often been before namely the placing herself considerably in advance of all her fellow-creatures the envied of many and the admired of all from this point the conversation proceeded in a tone of conjugal confidence and sympathy that might have served as a model to all the wedded sons and daughters of eve and no greater proof can be given of the happiness of such a self-contented temperament as that of my heroine than the fact that the interview which brought to her knowledge the proof of her husband's standing in the most imminent peril of being transported for life left her in a state of spirits the most animated and the most happy that can be conceived just as she was going to take her departure in order to set about her own preparations and leave her husband at liberty to make his she suddenly stopped short and exclaimed but my dear donny what in the world am i to say to those dear good perkinses and to that handsome creature tornorino upon my word that must be thought of it has been thought of my barnaby returned her husband with a playful smile that quite illuminated his countenance patty will tell you but no he added it will be safest for me to give you a sketch of the thing myself that you make no blunders when you hear the dear child allude to it just listen to me my dear and i will make you understand why it is that i am obliged to leave the country mr o'donagough then with some humour and very considerable enjoyment ran over the heads of the history he had been recounting to patty concerning his early passion and for a few gay moments felonies flittings transport ships and botany bay were all forgotten and both the gentleman and lady laughed heartily there certainly never was anything like you donny said the lady as soon as he had finished you have made my sides ache i promise you and there certainly never was anything like you my dear 
he replied with a very gallant bow i have often told you that you were a wife made on purpose for me and so you are End of chapters three and four chapters five and six of the barnabys in america this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five friendly confidence beautiful demonstrations of affection cold caution a painful contrast to it sisterly devotion a solemn promise when mrs o'donagough re-entered the drawing-room she found patty and her husband seated upon one sofa and the two miss perkinses on another the two former were deeply engaged in a whispering conversation the subject of which as the well-satisfied mother rightly imagined was those passages in the early history of the bride's father with which she had that morning been made acquainted the two latter did not appear to be conversing at all and to say the truth looked very particularly forsaken and forlorn it was to this group that mrs o'donagough immediately addressed herself for she too felt a pleasure in the exercise of the inventive faculty which was almost equal to that of her husband oh my dear girls she began what a history i have been listening to such a story has come out mercy on me i hardly know whether i stand on my head or on my heels oh dear me what is it cried miss louisa divided between fright and curiosity for mrs o'donagough by pressing her right hand strongly against her left side sighing deeply and casting up her eyes towards the ceiling gave her great reason to fear that there was some mixture of the terrible in what she was about to hear i dare say it is the same thing that my beloved patty is communicating to her husband said miss matilda eagerly do dearest mrs o'donagough let me hear it directly you must know how devotedly i am attached to you all and whatever concerns any one of the dear family is just the same to my poor heart as if it belonged to myself you are a good soul matilda as ever lived and so is louisa too so sit down one on each side of me and you shall hear it though i declare to heaven my hair actually stands on end upon my head at the very idea of repeating it saying these words mrs o'donagough seated herself in the middle of her sofa and taking in each of her own hands one of those belonging to miss louisa and to miss matilda perkins she began to repeat the history she had heard from her husband embellishing it a little as she went on by sundry feminine traits of impassioned tenderness on the part of the young countess and concluding with a hint that the untimely demise of that noble personage was the consequence of her unconquerable passion for mr o'donagough the only part of the history as recounted by that gentleman to his daughter which did not appear in the present version was that which seemed to infer a possibility that patty might be the offspring of the lady alluded to and not of the fond mother who so gloried in calling her daughter mr o'donagough showed considerable knowledge of human nature in omitting this part of the joke when discoursing on the subject to his wife he felt that there were things which might not safely be mentioned even in jest and that this was one of them it would be difficult nay perhaps impossible to find words capable of doing justice to the feelings of the miss perkins as they listened to this soul-stirring narrative disjointed expletives were all they could utter but clasped hands lifted eyes and long-drawn breath gave ample testimony to the powerful emotion which shook their respective frames at length the predominating feeling of miss matilda found vent in words having some show of meaning for she uttered distinctly the following and what my adored mrs o'donagough is it your intention to do go it is plain you must but where oh in such a case as this replied my heroine there is but one country in the world that a superior-minded man like mr o'donagough would think of for a moment of course we shall go to the united states that is to the most fashionable part of the country you may guess that i should not think of any other and there i have no doubt we shall be exceedingly happy o'donagough is exactly the man to be popular in a free country all his principles and ideas are upon the noblest and most extended scale and i know that i and patty too are particularly well fitted to live happily in a country where there are slaves in fact it is the only sort of servant in whom one can find any real comfort and i confess to you my dear girls that upon the whole i expect we shall enjoy ourselves famously i have not the least doubt in the world my dearest friend exclaimed miss matilda i would to heaven i was going with you then so you shall by jingo exclaimed the bride who had overheard the speech of her favourite if i say the word it's as good as done and that you know matilda nobody better 
if i had my way when i was plain patty o'donagough i leave you to guess if i am likely to be disappointed and contradicted and plagued and disobeyed now that i am a married woman and the wife of a don dearest patty ever ever the same cried miss matilda with vehement emotion what say you my dearest mrs o'donagough do you think that we might be permitted to join your delightful party i feel sure that both louisa and myself would know no happiness like that of devoting ourselves to you upon my life girls i should like it of all things for i am sure that i shall want somebody particularly just at first to talk to and to help me to settle things of course my dears you know that you would have to pay all your own expenses that's a matter of course and then if donny does not object i won't but what does louisa say to it i have not heard her voice yet upon being thus appealed to miss louisa ventured to say though her sister's eyes shot daggers at her the while that she did not think either matilda or herself young enough to venture upon going to a quite new country of which they knew nothing except that it was many thousands of miles off which would make it exceedingly difficult to come back again louisa perkins you are a fool if ever there was one born exclaimed madame tornorino and you may say that i told you so mrs o'donagough laughed aloud and said go where you will patty gentle and simple must all agree that you have a tongue in your head but never mind her louisa you have a right to your say as well as another and your opinion is that america is a great way off so it is my dear and you need not mind patty's impudence the least bit in the world miss louisa perkins seemed to be of the same opinion and certainly looked as if her equanimity was in no danger of being shaken by that lively lady's sallies but her feelings were differently constituted with respect to her sister for when miss matilda having seized upon her shawl and wrapped it energetically round her said come along sister she really looked as white as a sheet yes matilda you had better go away now child observed mrs o'donagough waving them off with her hand it is quite impossible that i can sit still to reason upon the subject when i have such an immensity to do you had better talk the matter over together all i have to say is that if you are ready to pay all your expenses and like to go i shall make no objection if donny makes none and you know how excessively fond he is of you both god bless you dearest mrs o'donagough sighed matilda as she pressed the hand of her condescending friend oh how i should glory in waiting upon you like your humblest servant in any land in the world that you could take me to you are a very good girl matilda replied mrs o'donagough and i dare say louisa will think better of it but louisa continued to maintain her ominous aspect and with a silent slow and melancholy step followed her sister into the street the maiden sisters walked along curzon street turned so as to reach park lane crossed into the park and still without exchanging a single word louisa was melancholy matilda moody but having at length reached that semi-sylvan path which stretches across the green sward towards brompton the full heart of the younger sister swelled too vehemently to be longer restrained and she uttered the following words if there is one misfortune in the world more hard to bear than all the rest it is the being tied up to a person too old and too stupid for anything the meek-spirited louisa who knew that a storm must come had been actually quivering inside and out from head to foot in the expectation of it and though the breeze that now began to whistle in her ears was not of the most balmy or gentle quality she still felt in some sort relieved that it had begun probably because the evils we anticipate are always more terrible in our imaginings than in the reality it was therefore with a very perceptible attempt at a cheerful manner that she replied come dear matilda don't fret yourself you can't think how it spoils your good looks and besides my dear sister you ought to remember that if two people are tied together as you call it the one young and the other old the one clever and the other stupid the clever and young one has so much the best of it that she ought to thank god day and night that she is not the other one it is much that i have to thank god for isn't it bitterly replied the unfortunate cadet i that never do never can and never shall i suppose have any one single thing that i wish for whatever you say louisa i must beg you that you will not be so disgustingly hypocritical as to pretend to tell me i'm not unhappy oh i am miserable i do believe you are my poor dear matilda returned the elder her eyes filling with tears and that it is which prevents me my being so perfectly happy as the goodness of god ought to make me for to tell you the truth i don't a bit mind being old and stupid 
because i have got used to it i suppose but i do mind seeing you fret and pine and take on so and all because nobody just happens to come in the way for you to be married to don't speak of that if you please you had much better let that subject alone interrupted matilda in accents as little soothing as it is easy to imagine unless indeed you wish to torture me which may very likely be the case and if so you cannot do better than go on oh matilda matilda how can you speak so i never in my whole life wished to do anything in the world but please you and god knows i love you quite as dearly as i do myself or i might say better and that without telling any fib for i would always a great deal rather have you pleased than be pleased myself and be as angry as you will with me matilda you cannot say it is my fault that you are not married yet not say it is your fault screamed matilda suddenly standing still and turning round so as to throw a broad side of indignant eye-beams under the bonnet of her suffering sister not your fault that passes by far anything that i could have thought it possible for a human being to utter not your fault that i am not married and who was it then if you please who prevented my being at this very moment mrs poxcroft i can bear anything better than falsehood miss louisa perkins and therefore i will just beg you as a favour never to say that again glad and glad shall i be to leave off saying anything that you don't like to hear matilda but sometimes i don't find out what it is till too late we will never talk any more about mr foxcroft then it is the best resolution we can take for we know he is a bad man and not worth anybody's talking about and that i suppose you say to please me too knowing as you do cruel hard-hearted creature that i still dote upon him to distraction replied matilda in violent agitation poor poor foxcroft she added while the embroidered pocket-handkerchief which she carried was raised to her eyes how different would now have been your fate had you fallen into other hands his only fault under heaven was the excess of his love for me his fond heart shrunk from the idea of seeing me living upon an income that he thought unworthy of my taste and refinement and for this and this only you lacerate my soul by making me listen to your eternal abuse of him indeed i am very sorry to hear you are so much in love with him still returned her sister and rather than that i do think my dear that it is better to remind you of what you heard yourself you know i mean his wanting so very much to marry me for the sake of my little fortune he never wanted to marry you replied the indignant matilda you totally mistook his meaning i am sure of it all his object was to endeavour to soften your heart towards me and persuade you if it was possible into fairly dividing your fortune between us and this you have chosen to twist and turn into his offering to marry you but this is only a piece with all the rest you were born to tyrannize over me and destroy me and nothing is left for me but to submit oh how often she added with a deep groan and casting her eyes upon the serpentine river which they were at that moment passing how often do i long to plunge into that placid water and bury my misery in it for ever miss matilda perkins had certainly during her thirty-six years of existence tried pretty nearly every species of device for the management and subjugation of her truly affectionate elder sister but somehow or other it had never before occurred to her that she might threaten suicide and now it was probably only the opportune sight of the water which had suggested the idea but whatever the cause she speedily felt inclined to bless the effect for never before had she even in her most energetic moments of eloquence uttered words productive of such powerful results miss louisa turned as pale as ashes and trembled visibly in every limb she clutched the arm of her sister with convulsive strength and hurried her onward though literally without the power of speaking a single word the effect of her experiment was not lost on miss matilda she attempted not to break the really awful silence which now reigned between them but suffered her sister to drag her onward unresistingly till they had reached their own door the knocker was made to do its office but still they spoke not and the door being opened they mounted miss matilda first and miss louisa afterwards to their drawing-room there the really miserable elder sister seated herself and burst into tears the younger permitted them to flow for some minutes uninterruptedly assuming meanwhile herself what she intended should be an aspect of dogged despair at length the poor louisa endeavoured to rally she drew off her gloves and tidily rolled them up then removed her shawl from her shoulders and began a similar notable process upon it smoothing and folding it upon her knee but certainly looking all the time as miserable as it was well possible to be matilda watched her closely 
and perceiving that notwithstanding her melancholy she was gradually recovering from the shock she had received and returning too nearly to the usual sensations of daily existence she took off her bonnet which she threw down notwithstanding it had a new feather in it with an air highly theatrical shook back her ringlets stood up approached her sister placed herself immediately before her and thus addressed her louisa the time is come when it is absolutely necessary that we should understand one another the existence i have been leading under your care and control has become much too painful to endure and i have come at length to the firm determination of changing or of ending it the choice louisa as to whether i shall make some effort to lessen the misery i endure or destroy myself i shall leave wholly to you if you will immediately readily and cheerfully consent to accompany our friends the o'donagoughs to america i will consent to live and will exert myself to the very utmost to render existence to both of us more happy in the new world than it has ever been in the old but if you refuse this if you persist in keeping me chained to this sterile land where the best and tenderest feelings of the human heart are checked and blighted by the constant fear of not having money enough to marry upon if i say you do this instead of permitting me to try my chance in a new world i solemnly declare to you that i will put an end to my life and when the awful deed is done you may learn too late the danger of torturing the human soul beyond its powers of endurance now then louisa speak decide i abide your decision and you must abide its consequences inexpressibly terrified at these dreadful words the unhappy louisa was ready to grant all and everything that was demanded of her and eagerly throwing her arms round the tall thin figure of her sister as she stood before her she exclaimed upon one condition matilda i agree to everything you shall go we will both go whenever and wherever you will if you will only make me one promise name it said matilda eagerly only promise me my dearest sister that if i consent to your wishes in this you will never think of killing yourself not even if you should not happen to get any gentleman to marry you in america i promise responded matilda solemnly louisa exclaimed thank god but the next moment heaved a heavy sigh whether this was caused by the remembrance of her own promise or breathed as a relief from the fullness of joy occasioned by that of her sister may be doubtful but be this as it may the business was settled matilda in a cheerful voice reminded her sister that a gentleman who had the eye of all the state authorities fixed upon him like mr o'donagough would not be permitted to linger long after receiving notice that he was to go and having given this necessary hint she instantly set to work herself upon drawers and boxes and by the vigorous earnestness of her labours gave the strongest proof of the vivacity of the feelings which prompted them it is needless to follow the preparations of the party thus about to leave england together for the united states suffice it to say that every one of them including don espartero cristinino tornorino was so active an expert in the several operations they were called upon to perform that in less than a week their passage was taken in a fine ship lying in the river and bound for new orleans their goods packed and on board their various affairs agencies and respective money concerns satisfactorily settled and one and all of them perfectly ready to go on board the above-mentioned don indeed though hitherto so slightly known to the reader and rather to be considered as a stranger than an old acquaintance will be found hereafter to possess many noble qualities well deserving a share in the affectionate feelings which i flatter myself his companions have already excited the only circumstance preliminary to their sailing which it is farther necessary to mention is that the principal personage and he who was considered on all sides as the hero of the expedition decided after giving a good deal of consideration to the subject that for many reasons into which it is totally unnecessary to enter it would be advisable that he should not appear in america under either of his former appellations but as a still farther compliment to his ever admired wife they should assume the style and title of major and mrs allen barnaby chapter six various reasons for not finding a river voyage tedious some account of the early years of don tornorino delightful contrast furnished by his present situation the soul of miss matilda perkins is entranced in the ecstasy of hope the mind of a passenger on board a merchant vessel working her way up the thames with very little wind and that little not above half favourable must be exceedingly preoccupied if he do not find this part of his expedition very long and very dull 
but notwithstanding the great variety of temperament by which the various individuals of the party we are about to accompany were distinguished there was not one of them who strictly speaking could be said to suffer from this evil miss louisa perkins indeed might to a superficial observer have been classed as one of the above-named victims of a slow progress through a disagreeable region but though her pale thin visage had no more movement or animation in it than that of a whiting boiled yesterday though her very light grey eyes had a plentiful lack of speculation in them and though she spoke not and moved not i who have the happy privilege of knowing every thought of her heart take upon me to declare that no idea that the river was long or dull ever entered her head she was there poor thing seated on the pea-green bench formed by the top of the chicken coop on purpose to be miserable not that her temper was of that sour quality which leads its possessor to find an indulgence in being uncontrolledly cross on the contrary the temper of miss louisa was essentially gentle and kind but this gentleness and this kindness had led her on the present occasion to do precisely the very thing that she most abhorred and in truth she could hardly choose but be miserable she hated every country and everything that was not english and everything that was american most of all she loathed the smell of a ship she detested the sea and had never been in a boat to cross a ferry without being rather sick and to add to all this she greatly doubted the efficacy of their present scheme for remedying the staple misery of her sister's existence that is to say she greatly doubted the probability of finding an american gentleman more inclined to marry a young lady of six-and-thirty without money than an english one so that on the whole it was hardly possible that she could be otherwise than sad her only comfort as she gazed upon the dirty water through which the vessel was crawling being the reflection that she had saved her sister from jumping into some very like it as to the hero of the party as i have already very fitly designated major allen barnaby he stood in a manly and commanding attitude his arms akimbo and his legs a straddle in the style of one of the sieur david's classic greeks sometimes looking ahead sometimes looking astern but always with an air of consciousness that the bark which bore him and his fortunes carried no ordinary freight the river was neither long nor dull to him could he forget how he last navigated in the same direction could he forget how much he had added to his little hoard since he passed up it in the other could he fail to feel that his glorious intellect and his happy star had enabled him again and again to rise triumphant out of misfortunes which must have overwhelmed a man of lesser genius and remembering all this could he do otherwise than look forward with bold hope and unshrinking confidence to the fresh career that was opening before him to him the tedious river voyage was but a soothing interval during which he could indulge without interruption or restraint in a series of exciting calculations and a succession of reveries each bringing flatteringly before his mind's eye the immense superiority of the new world over the old in all the arts of a highly advanced state of society and a complacent smile settled on his features as he thought of it mrs o'donagough to do her justice seldom felt anything to be tedious she could always find or make opportunities for displaying both her mind and body to advantage and who that does this can ever find any portion of existence fatiguing before the ship reached the downs she had made pretty nearly every sailor on board as well as the captain and the three mates understand that she knew very nearly as much about a ship as they did that besides all the personal beauty which remained to her and she really managed to take off ten years of her fifty-five much better than the generality of those who try their talents at the same operation besides all that remained she clearly made them all understand that she had some few years ago been infinitely handsomer still to the cook she gave some admirable instructions in ship cookery on the mind of the steward she strongly impressed the necessity of furnishing the passengers particularly the ladies with a liberal allowance of good toddy if he wished to keep them from the horrors of sea-sickness and she made the little black cabin-boy thoroughly understand that if ever he hoped to see the colour of her money he must never fail to come to her whenever she called let who would want him elsewhere with all this to be done could she find the river voyage too long as to don tornorino and his lady they had both mutually and separately much to amuse them the gentleman had very many reasons for feeling himself happy and contented and truly he was so but to what an extent no one can guess who is unacquainted with his previous history and as his fate is now so closely united to that of the amiable race to whose memoirs i am thus sedulously devoting myself a slight sketch of his early life may be desirable 
as i pique myself upon the unvarnished truth of my narratives i shall honestly confess to the reader that don espartero et cetera tornorino was not by birth an hidalgo on the contrary indeed his mother was a washerwoman and his father a tailor but in a country where the wholesome exercise of revolution is going on so prosperously as it has been long doing in spain it matters little what a man's father may be provided he himself knows how to profit by the delightful whirlwind of accidents by which he is sure to be surrounded the young tornorino was a very pretty boy and he was a sharp boy and moreover he was a very musical boy and by the help of all these good gifts together there were few youngsters in that not very tranquil country who had so pleasant a life he was very religious too and all the priests that were left in madrid made much of him he both danced and sung to perfection and juan cristino delighted in him several seamstresses were willing to make him shirts for nothing and there was not a cook-shop in the city that had a woman in any part of the establishment where he might not get the very best of dinners for the asking besides all this his excellent and patriotic father had become a chef d'escadron to some faction or other i really forget what and his mother lady of the bedchamber to her majesty so that his position in society appeared as assured as it was brilliant and a happier young don never strutted through the highways and byways of madrid than the young raven-haired tornorino all this lasted till he was twenty-four years old and three months and then poor fellow just as he had got confirmed in every habit of extravagance luxury and indulgence he was literally turned from the court into the gutter his father was shot as a traitor having very unluckily been caught in the act of appropriating some small regimental funds that had happened to come in his way his mother was discarded from her high and very distinguished office and a young milliner installed in her place and the poor petted son for no reason in the world that i know of save that he had outlived the royal lady's favour was also informed that his attendance was no longer required the unfortunate widow of the gallant chef d'escadron died of starvation within the year and her accomplished son sold eleven of his twelve guitars all his gold snuff-boxes and five of his six sword-knots in order to convey himself to england and try his fortune there and a dismal fortune it proved poor fellow as soon as the few naps he had brought with him had disappeared he tried a greater variety of expedients to get more than i have time to record among other things he played in the orchestra at drury lane and danced in the ballets at covent garden he gave lessons in most living languages to all who would be so kind as to learn and offered to teach the guitar for a shilling a lesson but somehow or other nothing succeeded with him he was almost always taking a siesta when he ought to have been rehearsing at the theatre and he no sooner got a pupil than he began making love to the mother or the sister and so got kicked into the street then every farthing of money he got he was obliged to spend at some leicester square restaurant where he could obtain a plat or two seasoned with a little garlic for he felt as if he really must die if he attempted to swallow a chop or a steak prepared for him at his lodgings but after all there was really as little harm in him as could reasonably have been expected under the circumstances and amongst the multitudinous patriots with which london abounds patty might easily have done worse the variety of pleasant thoughts which now chased each other through the young man's head as he sat beside his bride quietly and smilingly receiving and returning her caresses was perfectly delightful by far the most distinguishing feature of his mind was a love of ease and indeed of indulgence of all kinds and this had made the privations endured since reaching england something almost too dreadful to think of his reverence for the father and mother of his young wife knew no bounds he saw that their manner of living was exceedingly far removed as far at least as he could judge of it from dry mutton chops hard beefsteaks black cold potatoes and muddy beer these various articles had formed a large portion of his misery for the last four years and the idea that he was now to live daintily comparatively speaking and do no work wrapped his senses in a sort of sweet elysium that kept him in a continual smile moreover he loathed hated and abominated the climate of england to a degree that made the act of sailing away from it something little short of rapture he was going to see the sun again the very name of new orleans whenever it reached his ears caused him to display his well-set white teeth to an unmitigated excess and so perfectly well satisfied was he with his present position that had queen christina stood before him he would have snapped his fingers at her and would hardly have consented to change it had the great general whose name he had assumed offered his own to him instead as for patty nobody who knows patty could doubt for a moment her being in a state of perfect felicity 
for in spite of jack and all his false-heartedness she was married and instead of having one kiss to talk about she had now more than she could count and the river seemed to her a very pleasant river the wind a very good wind and the ship a very nice ship but of all this happy well-contented party the most supremely happy and the most rapturously well-contented was beyond all question miss matilda perkins the annoyances that the don was leaving behind him were light indeed compared to the various and for ever recurring sources of agony which had lacerated her tender bosom for years never perhaps had any woman loved so often and so devotedly oh she felt to the very centre of her soul that she deserved to be loved again and the having failed of this well-merited reward and that too through at least twenty years of unremitting though various affection had left a bitterness of indignation at her heart which poisoned all her hours and rendered her life one mournful long-drawn love-lorn sigh but now how delightfully was all around her changed what a rainbow radiance fell upon every thought of the future hope sprang aloft upon exulting wings the bark that supported her slight figure as she gracefully leaned over the taffrail seemed wafted by breezes from heaven and its sails filled by the soft sweet breath of love miss matilda was in her way a great reader she had dipped into several accounts of america and she was quite aware how exceedingly the natives were behind hand in all matters of grace and fashion what an enormous advantage therefore would this give her over all the native daughters of the land how certain did she feel that her knowledge of life her elegant manners her particularly small waist and two or three new bonnets and dresses which she had bought at the bazaar two days before she set off would place her in a position of immeasurable superiority above everybody that she was at all likely to be seen with in short her swelling heart felt no fears for the result and the only thing approaching anxiety which crossed her mind was the question whether it would be best for her to accept the first man that offered or wait a little to take the advantage of choice miss matilda certainly did not mean to assimilate herself to a housemaid nevertheless having a general idea that a certain letter concerning australia which she had heard greatly admired was somehow or other about america she could not but recall with interest the historical fact therein mentioned which records that marriageable females arriving from the motherland were so eagerly sought in wedlock there that proposals were made to them as they approached the land through speaking trumpets had this circumstance been recalled to the mind of miss matilda as one which had influenced her wish to leave england it is highly probable that she would have rejected the suggestion with disdain and have declared herself not such a fool as to take for earnest what was perhaps written in jest it is however unquestionably certain that there had been moments in the course of the last ten years of miss matilda perkins's existence during which this graphic image of abounding husbands had returned again and again to her fancy throwing a sort of el dorado halo around the name of america which had not been without its effect i know it is put down there most likely in the way of a joke she had one day said to herself in musing monologue but for all that i dare say it means something there is no fire without smoke and miss matilda looked at the map but how could her wildest dreams at that time have painted the possibility of her ever traversing such a world of water yet here she was beyond the possibility of a doubt actually embarked on board a ship bound to america the fact was so extraordinary so astounding so delightful that sometimes it seemed to transcend all reasonable belief and at others to elevate her spirits almost beyond the power of restraining them with proper limits such a delightful party too her most particular friend a young married woman proverbially the best of chaperones and then her husband so fond of her such happiness between them continually suggesting to every one who saw them the dear idea of matrimony as the easiest and surest mode of attaining perfect felicity can we wonder that the soul of miss matilda was swimming in bliss as buoyantly as the ship was swimming upon the waters and thus they made their way down the majestic bosom of the thames the only grumbling observation proceeding from the lips of poor louisa and that was not much she only muttered to herself it is a long lane they say that has no turning but oh dear it is a longer still that has got so many End of chapters five and six Chapter Seven of the Barnabys in America by Francis Milton Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven. Emotions of the party in landing at New Orleans. 
their reception at mrs carmichael's boarding-house peculiar confirmation of that lady the party installs themselves the dawn proves useful we will not a second time follow the o'donagough henceforth the barnaby family step by step or rather not by not across the atlantic after a safe and not particularly long passage they arrived at the belize and being placed under the towage of a steamboat began to make their way up the lordly but gloomy tempered mississippi thank god exclaimed major allen barnaby for it was thus he now commanded himself to be constantly designated thank god he exclaimed as he sprung on shore to the handsome quay of new orleans we have had a devilish fine passage but i'm not sorry it's over we are none of us sorry it's over i dare say replied his portly lady as soon as she had recovered her balance upon first finding both her feet once more on terra firma we are the very luckiest creatures upon earth that's certain major how the sun shines don't it the facility with which it was probable mrs barnaby would fall again into her old habit of calling her husband major had in truth been one reason why her john william patrick allen o'donagough barnaby had chosen to assume that title in preference to every other and the scheme answered completely for so naturally did she resume this appellation endeared to her doubtless by the remembrance of the early days of her love that from that time forward she was never known to blunder when addressing him excepting that now and then at the name of allen which he had slipped in before that of barnaby as if to identify himself she would come to a full stop and now captain said the restored major can you lend us a lad just to take these few light articles that the custom-house gentlemen have done with and show us the way to the boarding-house you were talking about caesar cabin boy shall go along with ye replied the captain only i'm thinking that madam carmichael will hardly it may be have place enough to put you all up and without notice given too but for all that you had best go to her and say i sent you she'll be able i expect to get some of ye lodged out of the house if there is not room in it the whole party amounting as we know to half a dozen were by this time collected in a knot and ready to start on the whole perhaps they did not present a very elegant coup d'oeil but it is rarely that any ladies appear to advantage on arriving from a voyage yet they had all save the poor worn-out miss louisa done the best they could towards restoring their appearance mrs barnaby had liberally refreshed her rouge and put on a clean collar but her front was sadly out of repair being in fact entirely worn out and permitting her copious locks of dappled grey to peep forth in various places from amidst the scanty sable with which it was her object to conceal them madame tornorino however certainly looked a great deal handsomer than she ever did before in the whole course of her life for she was almost pale and considerably thinner than before her voyage but her costume was anything but in good repair and she had not like her mamma thought it necessary to put on a clean collar the hopeful ardent-minded matilda was unhappily thinner than ever and so pale that as she turned her eyes from her own cheeks as shown to her one at a time in the useful little glass set at the back of her hair-brush as she turned her eyes from those pale cheeks to the glowing bloom on those of mrs barnaby she suddenly and secretly came to the resolution that for the future she would herself in a moderate way take advantage of the aid which nature with her usual provident kindness has prepared for the fading carnations of females of delicate constitution for the present however this was out of her power as mrs barnaby's rouge was always locked up but she thought that at the present moment she should lose little by the pallid delicacy which in consideration of her long voyage could not but be interesting she therefore gave all the care that circumstances would permit to other decorations for how was it possible she could tell who she might see not only did she put on a clean collar but a clean cap too yet she suffered her hair to fall somewhat too languidly on each side of her face for it was a little out of curl but oh how she pitied poor dear mrs barnaby for having all her beautiful hair turning grey and how heartily she thanked heaven in her heart of hearts that not even her sister louisa had a grey hair which plainly showed it was not in the family and gave her the most charming hope for her own future so her gauze cap with its pale pink bows was set very far back on her head and the bonnet which was lightly placed upon it had quite the air of a chapeau de jolie femme the two gentlemen also had somewhat refreshed their toilettes in compliment to the character given of mrs carmichael by her friend the captain which was that she was as first-rate a lady as any in the place and unaccountable smart to be sure with a light truck to convey such baggage as they were permitted to take from the ship before the custom-house had done its duty 
the young negro caesar moved on before them and the party followed under a broiling sun to the boarding-house excepting don tornarino who luxuriated in the warmth like a humming-bird the whole set felt ready to lie down and expire before they had traversed half the distance they had to go but as the major strode resolutely on without flinching the four ladies felt that they must stride resolutely on too and they did so with a degree of enduring patience that did them honour fortunately on arriving at the house of mrs carmichael they were desired to walk into the keeping-room had they been turned from the door the most of them felt quite certain that they should not have lived to reach another it is almost worth while however to endure the fervid heat of a southern climate for the sake of enjoying the delicious devices by which the ingenuity of that very clever creature man contrives to quench its terrors and turn its very torment into luxury the apartment into which mrs carmichael's negro footman showed the panting europeans was a room of some forty feet long by twenty wide and lofty in proportion the expansive floor was covered by cool-looking matting and round the walls were ranged a variety of sofas formed for lounging in every possible attitude of louisianian indolence four ample windows opened like folding doors upon a balcony rendered almost impervious to the light by being on all sides surrounded by venetian blinds and on a table within the room stood one or two enormous decanters of water with lumps of ice floating in them tumblers of all sizes about a dozen lemons and abundance of sugar while under the table stood a basket-covered flask of whisky of a goodly size a dozen or two of light caned bottom chairs were scattered about the room lying upon many of which as well as upon the tables and sofas were a multitude of large feather fans the profusions of which might have struck the strangers as a whimsical peculiarity had not their obvious utility been so very strongly felt my goodness gracious what a heavenly place cried patty instantly taking possession of a sofa throwing herself at full length upon it and seizing upon the largest fan within her reach by your leave ladies she added taking off her bonnet and tossing it upon the ground married women you know are always permitted to take liberties what a blessing to be sure to come into a room like this after such a walk said mrs barnaby carefully wiping her face so as to remove as little of her rouge by the operation as possible i hope to goodness major we ain't to stay in this horrid climate long however as long as we do stay we can't do better off than here so you must loosen your purse-strings if you please if it should prove that the elegant lady the captain told us of happens to be rather uppish in her prices we'll see about that my dear replied her husband it will be a great object to be sure to get into a place where one can breathe but money is money remember in america as well as in england you rappelle said the delighted spaniard the soft atmosphere of madrid i am sure they must be a most delightful people cried matilda who though not a married woman had ventured to follow the example of patty and was both lying down and fanning herself without ceremony how irresistibly said she all this seems to suggest ideas of in short i am certain it must be a most domestic country from the evident care taken to make home agreeable as usual poor louisa spoke not indeed she had hardly done so since she had left her native land but gently unobtrusively and apart she groaned and now a sound was heard as of the approach of slippers too large for the wearer's feet and kept on by dint of shoving them onwards at each step without venturing to raise them from the ground and then the voice of hard and difficult breathing was perceptible and then the door of entrance was darkened from side to side as if a feather bed exactly not too large to be pushed through it was being thrust into the room of course the twelve eyes of the newcomers were all turned towards the object thus appearing before them and notwithstanding the obscurity of the apartment they one and all very soon became convinced that huge and shapeless as was the approaching mass it was nevertheless a human being and moreover a woman smart murmured patty in a voice not quite audible to the panting dame what could that fool of a captain mean and certainly in patty's acceptation of the word his application of it might seem strange enough the person of mrs carmichael the dimensions of which were seen in whatever direction she could be placed very nearly six feet by four was not only enormous in size but so astonishingly out of all ordinary shape as to make it no easy matter to clothe it at all it is not very surprising therefore considering the prodigious bulk of every limb whereby every movement became a labour that mrs carmichael should get into her clothes with as little labour and pains as possible and then the heat 
poor mrs carmichael suffered dreadfully from the heat and certainly cared greatly less how her draperies looked in the eyes of others than how they felt to herself so her enormous white calico gown with its colossal hanging sleeves was fastened so loosely in the front by one single pin as to create perpetual alarm in the bystanders as to the stability of the investiture by which this very important portion of her covering was attached there was indeed what might have been about a yard square of pink gauze loosely tucked in around the bust but even this depended for its adhesion to the same aforesaid pin and without it must have floated away into air still thinner than itself notwithstanding the immensity of mrs carmichael's person it was not as in the case of a preternaturally expansive oak tree the result of advanced age every year of which had added to its bulk all the fat which had thus miraculously found a resting-place on the bones of mrs carmichael had been considerably less than forty years in collecting itself together and had her face been finished by one chin instead of three and the rest of her features in less evident danger of being smothered she would have been far from ill-looking excepting the pink gauze and the white robe already described with the probable garment under it together with her large slippers and probable stockings she was as much without the foreign aid of ornament as eve herself stays she had none she wore nothing on her head nor was there the slightest reason whatever to suppose that she was embarrassed by anything more in the way of clothing than what has already been described excepting the hard breathing and an occasional ejaculation expressive of fatigue from moving mrs carmichael uttered nothing for several minutes after she entered the apartment having at length made her way to the part of the room where major allen barnaby stood fanning himself she dropped down upon a large cane chair without any arms every part of which back and all became so completely invisible that she seemed to have perched herself on a three-legged stool having thus deposited her person she fixed her soft eyes on the major's face and seemed to expect that he should speak first but her heavy breathings gave her so much the appearance of being as yet unfit for any exertion that her visitor was too polite to address her and it was therefore mrs carmichael herself who at last opened the conversation what is your pleasure sir she said in a voice which notwithstanding her want of breath was harmonious though somewhat drawling i have called madam he replied at the request of your friend captain timms to inquire whether you can accommodate our party with board and lodging mrs carmichael eyed the numerous group very complacently for the whole kit of you sir she demanded with a smile as sweet as it was possible a smile could be from lips so overwhelmed by cheeks yes madam for all of us and for a goodish spell sir very likely madam but that must depend on circumstances of course sir of course well then i don't know i rather expect i might make it convene provided any two of the ladies could lie together the two miss perkinses exclaimed at the same moment oh we can do that ma'am quite well well now i calculate it might be done then but in course you'll be wanting to see the rooms before you agree and that's what black jessie can do for you and so saying she clapped her great soft hands together and though the sound thus produced was rather a dumb one it sufficed to bring a smart-looking negress into the room who having received sufficient orders from her mistress stepped lightly and not ungracefully forward to do her bidding turning her face towards the strangers and displaying her white teeth as an invitation to them to follow her this the whole kit did though with some reluctance perhaps at being obliged to put themselves in motion again but the great large house was really as cool as it was possible a new orleans house in the month of july could be and they could hardly fail of being satisfied with the well-ventilated rooms clean mosquito bars and handsome wardrobes which were displayed to them this will do major capital won't it said mrs allen barnaby in high good humour yes my dear if you will undertake to pay for it he replied don't come with any of that sort of nonsense over me donny she replied forgetting herself for a moment i am not going to begin the old sydney way over again i promise you you'll remember my dear that i am a little more up to your doings than i was then and if i give you the assistance of my talents and keep you up with my respectability and fashion i shall expect to be comfortably lodged in return i promise you this was however all conjugally whispered in the ear of her husband as they stood apart together for a moment in a room that was decidedly the biggest and the best and which both of them had tacitly selected as their own we shall see my dear we shall see 
he replied without displaying any marks of anger at her remonstrance but you know as well as i do that everything must depend upon the chance of finding people that will suit us of course dear of course but take my word for it major that you will do nothing to signify either here or anywhere else if you don't carry it with a high hand at first and make them understand that you are a somebody you are not far from wrong there my dear and now let's go down again to our fatima by the way this new orleans beauty makes you look as slender as a girl my dear mrs allen barnaby some thought of the same kind had already passed through the analytical head of mrs allen barnaby herself and she felt so kindly disposed towards the person who could produce so agreeable an effect that the negotiation which followed their return to the keeping-room was speedily brought to a happy termination poor miss louisa perkins started a little at hearing that she was to pay ten dollars a week for herself and her sister but permitted herself to be satisfied upon mrs carmichael's proposing to abate one provided the ladies did not mind sleeping in rather a small room upstairs that looked towards the west all preliminaries being thus happily settled the party gladly accepted their obliging hostess's invitation to take possession of the keeping-room and its sofas till such time as the arrival of their baggage should enable them to settle themselves in their own apartments and get ready for dinner the hour for which she informed them was five o'clock it was nearly two and some natural anxiety began to be expressed by the ladies lest those ever precious objects of interest their trunks might not arrive in time and now it was that for the first time patty's dawn gave evidence that it was possible he might be of some little use for upon major allen barnaby's declaring that he neither could nor would go out again during the heat of the day for all the trunks in the world the young spaniard declared that the sun was delightful to him and having received the most distinct instructions from each particular lady as to which particular box it was especially essential he should get released for her instantly he set off upon his mission and performed it so well that by four o'clock the whole party were made supremely happy by finding themselves in the full enjoyment of their unpacked treasures and as well able to make themselves fine as if they had never left london End of chapter seven